Uh, Joe Charnetsky uh, from Sprinkler. Check your programs for more information about Sprinkler, but we are uh, the only unified customer experience management platform on planet Earth, so let's talk more about that. But this panel here today, I'll let you guys do uh, an intro of yourselves. We're going to talk about the future, exciting, of uh, marketing and innovation. We've got a great list of questions. Tyler, why don't you kick us off with a brief intro? Yeah, my name is Tyler Simmons, and I run strategy and innovation for IMAX. Hi, everybody. I'm Kamal Bindal. I head up the global brand and consumer marketing for the Invisalign brand. And our company is called Align Technology. But I always introduce with that Invisalign brand because that's what we're best known for. Hey everybody. I'm Josh Blacksmith, um, and I work with Kimberly Clark. I lead our global digital transformation. Um, so the, again, we're all about the future of marketing and innovation in this discussion. So I'll just start with an easy one. What's going to happen in the future? No, I'm just kidding. No, that's not true. So, uh, come on, I know you just got here. You guys have been here for a few days. So, um, what have you seen or heard this week, either here at Brand Innovators or just from the conversations with, uh, with peers that has gotten you particularly excited about the future of marketing, innovation, all those topics? Josh, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of the brands that we uh, that we own is um, Huggies. And so, of course, um, taking a look at some of the different baby care um, uh, technology that's out there. Um, and one of the things that I've seen is a, um, a use of AI um, for a stroller. It's called the Ella. It was really cool. Um, it's basically a startup in Canada that has this um, stroller that when you take the baby out, it self-drives behind you. It has AI built in to help avoid obstacles. So it's pretty cool, um, pretty cool functionality. Um, I also saw another, another in the space that was a baby monitor. These have been around for a while, um, but this was really cool um, uh, from uh, – I think it was called it was Sonos Boa. Um, and it uh, actually has four different monitors uh, built into it around sort of temperature, um, rollover, um, uh, movement. Um, and so it was uh, another really cool one. And on a personal level, um, some of the things I saw, uh, there's a, um, a new wearable um, that actually delivers scent uh, for VR. Um, definitely probably wouldn't work too well for some of our brands. <laughs> you probably don't want to have that around the Huggies. Um, uh, so that's a pretty cool one. And then, of course, I always love watching what's happening with holograms because when I think about sort of the application of um, uh, VR uh, in the future, like holograms is sort of the ability to have VR without having any sort of device uh, in my mind, right? So always sort of watching sort of the features and functionality, some of the different things that roll out in that space. It's been fun. Yeah, I haven't had the opportunity to check out the floor or anything, but I think um, in the conversations I've had in a lot of these roundtables, um, you know, it's not the the shiny kind of cool stuff. A lot of what I've heard and I think is true to how we're kind of looking to next year, it's um, a little bit more just back to the basics, you know? Um, I think there's a lot of folks that are prepping for, again, a post-pandemic world and then, you know, a potential recession, all these things, and I think that... Um, I mean, a lot of people are trying to figure out, well, you know, how uh, can we really hone in on, on the impact we're having as innovation, marketing, and transformation teams? So not necessarily the the sexiest stuff, but um, very much a kind of a back to the basics and how do we really, you know, double down and focus on the things that are going to, you know, drive kind of core business. So that's kind of what I've been hearing. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to say in these uncertain times at any point in this <laughs> yeah. panel, but in these uncertain times. Um, I, I mentioned in my intro, so Sprinkler Unified Customer Experience. Customer experience means 5,000 things to ev every group. So let me talk to you guys about, about that. Um, and maybe at two levels, let's make it a big question. Um, strategically, what do you think about when you tackle the idea of customer experience? And we have three very different organizations here, which is exciting. And then a little bit more tactically, how are you prioritizing with your teams what you want to do to improve CX? And anyone can jump in. Come sure, on, sure. I, I'll start. So our, our business is twofold, right? So it's a push-pull model where some of our customers are the actual end user. So anybody here who's had Invisalign, either themselves or, or in their household, you'd be one of our customers. And then there's also the doctor who delivers. And so for us customer experience is really about ensuring both sets of those customers really have a strong, positive experience end-to-end. -end. Everything from 
whether it's you know the interaction that the doctor has with anybody in this room in their practice to then placing the order with us and then for us to get that order out. So we always take a look at what are our points of delight along that customer journey for each one of those customers and then where are the points of failures. And so as I think about your next question, which is where are we focusing, it's really figuring out those areas that are points of delight, ensuring that we have consistency in those points of delight across all of our markets and then the areas that are points of failures, because we're all going to have those, right, that are subpar, really figuring out of those that are points of failures, what are the ones that are standing in the way of either getting somebody to say yes, or also getting somebody to advocate for the brand so that when they're talking about their experience with the brand, they're talking about it in a positive way. And you, you mentioned the markets. That's a great point. What defines a point of delight in different markets are very different things. That's right. And I, and I think that's such an important piece for all marketers to be aware of, right? Because our, our bias is going to be whatever our background is. And I think really understanding the end user, whoever the customer is in that particular market, and figuring out what does it mean to them, so important. Yeah, so I'll build on that because um, very similar sort of approach. But one of the things we think about is um, should we really be defining what our consumers need or expect, or should we let consumers tell us what they need and expect of our brands? Um, and so strategically, we're moving down the path of actually introducing something we're calling a CX score. Um, and the spirit of this is so that we can actually reach out to our consumers across each of our brands and ask them, what do you expect of brands in our categories? Um, and then go back to them and say, well, how well do we measure up in delivering on those expectations versus our nearest competitors? And so we're using that as a way to help guide our strategic focus, our tactical focus around where we think we can unlock the most value. That's super interesting. Um, without giving away any trade secrets, are, is that CX score adjusted at all for the, I mean, you guys have many divisions, many products. Do you think about that differently across the organization? Yeah, that's where it actually gets pricey um, <laughs> because we're thinking about it through the lens of each individual brand. Yeah. Um, so, but I think one of the things that's exciting about it is we're not focused just on like sort of, sort of where our brands might traditionally play. We're thinking about the category in its broadest sense. And so when we think about long-term growth, sort of what are those spaces where our brands have the opportunity to actually create more value in ways that we might not typically even realize that, that we're thought of, you know, in that way. Yeah, and I think for, you know, for us, like uh, at IMAX, much like probably a lot of people here, um, you know, the consumer journey is no longer, you know, linear. It's a very all over the place, back and forth, looks more like a scribble than anything. And so I think that, you know, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of the, you know, let's say the infrastructure and trying to, you know, collect all that data and better understand that customer. And I think that that's definitely a foundational element. But for us, it's starting to actually look beyond that and how across that journey, um, how do we not just, um, you know, enhance but extend the, ex the, the spectacle um, of an entertainment event. So whether that's a concert, um, which is something that we're starting to get into, into music, uh, whether that's a film, whether that's a gaming or kind of a sports championship. And the way I kind of try to simplify it more in my mind is, you know, there are all these micro moments, um, whether that lead up and are afterglows of a, a transaction or experience or what have you. And, you know, I liken it to like planning a trip to Italy. You know, you, you buy a ticket and that's six months, a year away but you're gonna likely go have a pasta dinner with your friends or your family. You're gonna start to do research on what you're gonna do and that context enriches that experience. And so for us, we're starting to think again, how across that journey do we you know, extend and enhance the storytelling? So if you, you think about something like an avatar, which you know, is out right now, um, you probably would have gone and seen the first one. To, it's been 13 years since that came out and so, providing that context as there a podcast you might listen to is after you see it, is there now a kind of out of home experience that maybe it does experience the world of Pandora because the next avatar, I don't know when that one's gonna come out. So how do you kind of continue to that where it gives more you know, richness and context to that spectacle or that event beyond just, you know, oh, we went to the movies or went to a concert. So. 
I love the, the customer journey scribble. Yes. That is one thing I'm taking away from this for sure. <laughs> I will say one of my regrets of 2022 was uh, not seeing Top Gun Maverick in IMAX. Well, I loved it. I saw it. But as soon as I left, I was like, oh, man, I should have seen this. Yeah, Got to do it. That was a mistake. <laughs> there you go. Um, so it is uh, uh, um, you know, conference at the beginning of 2023. So, of course, I asked chat GPT, what questions should I ask you guys today? And it came back with a list. They were all fine. Um, a little bland, maybe. But there was one that I thought, oh, you know what? I hadn't thought of that. Let's do it. So this is uh, from our friends at ChatGPT. Here's a question for all of you. How do you foster a culture of innovation within your org and encourage employees to bring new ideas to the table? We're talking about a lot of exciting things here. You're, you're all going to go back to work next week and be fired up with all the things you heard and learned. Change is hard. The ship turns slowly. How do you and your orgs you know, foster that spirit of innovation? Yeah, I can go first. Um, so I'd say, first of all, we need 90, 95% of the organization just focused on the fundamentals. Um, and so it's really important for us to make sure that we're not telling every single individual in our organization that it's their job to sort of drive the innovation, whether it's product innovation, whether it's digital innovation. Um, but once we've established sort of like where innovation lives within the organization, we have stood up capabilities teams, um, both on the physical product, but also sort of the interaction, the integration of digital and physical product. Um, and we provide those teams with the autonomy and the ability to sort of go solve, go figure out like what is the next thing that we need to be sort of the spaces that we need to be playing. Um, some of the work that we've, um, we've done, we have a digital innovation lab that's sort of working to um, experiment in spaces that are sort of relatively nascent. Um, and I realize like maybe uh, VR Web3 like may not be super nascent now. It still feels really nascent to me. We're still experimenting a ton. Um, but in partnership with our digital innovation lab, they were actually able to build an entire world just for internal use where we ran an entire two day session inside this world and everybody could go to different sort of breakout rooms and the interactive experience within that just as a way of training all of our day-to-day -day brand managers and what this experience could really look like and feel like. Um, and so it's super valuable to make sure that we have our team sort of focused on demonstrating the value this can create in ways that are sort of engaging like that for us. Yeah, I think it, for us it comes down to three three key things, right? I think first it starts with the hiring. I always talk to candidates and ask the question, you know, what kind of organization or team are you really looking to to be a part of? And there's two types of marketers, I think, and neither is right or wrong. They're just different, right? And I've been in both throughout my career. And the first is, you know, you you join an organization and they say, hi, Kamal, welcome to the team. Here's the playbook. Don't mess it up. Right, figure out how you're going to eke out some incrementality, um, but don't mess it up. The second is, is you know, we've got a lot of problems to solve. Here's the playbook. You're going to notice a lot of it's empty. Help us figure out what those plays are. So we always ask this question. I always do as a part of our our hiring. And and again, neither is right or wrong, but there's different. And so we we really look for those who are looking to help write that playbook. I think then once you're a part of the organization, the concept of psychological safety has always been one that. I'm a big fan of, right? Really ensuring that people on the team feel as though they can say what's on their mind, try different things. And, and the reality is we don't know what's gonna work, right? We've got some hunches, we've got some data that's gonna help us have a degree of confidence, but we're gonna need to get a lot of things right, wrong, sorry, we're gonna need to get a lot of things wrong before we get that one thing right, right? And then the third is, is to then reinforce that behavior and celebrate the failures as equally as celebrating the wins. And I think too often, and, and this has been an evolution for us as an organization, being the disruptor, it's always been part of our DNA to be the innovator. But so often, you know, it's natural human behavior to glom onto the, what doesn't work and penalize it, right? What we say is, hey, what's, what are some of the failures that we've had so that we can ensure the organization understands that people understand we value those just as much as the wins. Yeah, and building on what Kamal said, I think it's, you know, for us, it's like democratizing innovation. I think um, a lot of times it gets siloed into a group that these are the people that are paving, you know, the path towards the future. And I think that, um, you know, that, that a lot of times can be a misstep. And, you know, as, just as Kamal said, it's, you know, uh, I think that starts with creating a safe place for, 
um, from not just people in innovation and marketing, but finance people and kind of encouraging that type of behavior that uh, you know makes it comfortable uh, for people to make mistakes because innovation is about making mistakes. And so I think that you know for us it's you know one kind of fostering that culture and then it's two it's sort of um, leading by doing. And um, you know for us that's a lot of testing and learning. Uh, innovation is more of a cost center than a profit center at first. And so uh, I think kind of showing the you know the impact that little small things can have to sort of you know really catalyze that kind of energy and excitement to continue to invest in innovation i think is something that we try to do um so you talked about going back to basics yeah. at the very beginning you just talked about making sure 95 percent of the org is focused on the, the fundamentals so the opposite of innovation right i suppose to some degree when we all talked in, in prep for this session um, you all in some way brought up the idea that it's easy to get distracted by the shiny new technology trend of the, and it's important to keep people focused. You know, there are, there are those opportunities, you wanna seize them, but you've gotta stay focused on it. So again, how do you not get distracted and how do you keep teams focused? Do you wanna start it off? Yeah, I mean, I think it, for me, it comes back to a really, really simple question is, is there a user or consumer problem that that shiny object is solving? And, and again, in innovation, I think it's fun. There's, a, you, know, a, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say NFTs, metaverse, and crypto or whatever else you have, the chatbot wants me to say. But I think for, um, you know, for us, it's going back is uh, that's what really grounds us. Are we actually solving a problem that needs to be solved? Or are we just spinning our wheels to do something that is shiny? <clears throat> yeah, you know what, Tyler, I think we've got so much in common here. We always talk about um, what problem are we looking to solve? And I'll go back to that consumer journey, right? That nonlinear scribble and those points of failures. Uh, we know we have points of failures. If we continue to get focused on the shiny new object without improving those points of failure, the revenue is not going to come, right? It's as simple as that for us. And so the way to help keep teams focused, you know, what we have found is is keeping the awareness high on those points of failure and really ensuring that everybody on the team is aware as to what those are front and center. We don't hide from them. We embrace them and say, until we've solved or improved on these points of failure, we're just not going to be able to, to go in. Now, now, that doesn't mean that we don't try new things, right? So as we think about our budget, we always kind of use that 70 20 10 rule and that 10 percent is really about trying new and different things so that we get the learning fast for us that was around the metaverse and we had our first entree into the metaverse but we did it in a way that lined up with a core problem that we needed to solve as opposed to doing it just to do it yeah i think a couple things for us i think um first of all um i think it's really important that you lead with bold vision um, and if you sort of lead with the bold vision and aren't prescriptive in terms of the path to get there, then it gives teams the ability to sort of experiment and figure out what does work best to deliver on that, on that ambition. Um, I think the other thing for us is um, we talk a lot and we, we've talked a lot about sort of the consumer journey. For us, it's um, unrealistic to think about solving every single moment along that journey. Um, if we try to put that much attention and energy into every single moment, we do everything sort of subpar. Um, so for us, in order to sort of organize teams around this, we ensure that we're prioritizing. What are those key moments along that journey where we have an outsized opportunity, an outsized advantaged opportunity to actually drive growth for the business? And we focus our teams around those specific moments and allow them to go as deep as they want, it, want into sort of solving the problems around those moments. But just like everybody else, sort of rooted in business growth objective, consumer experience opportunity um, to drive that. Let the consumer guide you. That's a great final message. Robust round of applause, please. Tyler, Kamal, and Josh.